Okay, so we have, just to be on the same page, we have uh, teaching hours are uh, Mondays, and we have it from 2.15 all the way to 5. That's a very long session. And then we have tomorrow, so, so you start the week with me, you like it or not. <laughs> I have that to, you know, to keep your your spirit lifted from the beginning of the week so you can hold the, the the rest of the week and then all the way to 12 usually we teach is like 45 minutes and then we have 15 minutes break but sometimes we don't want to cut some particular topic so it might stretch a bit for to the next hour or we might finish a bit early from the hour before so don't take these you know stops too too strict uh, the room is in this same room. I hope, you know, with the amount of people, we should have gotten a, a, big, a bigger room. But so, P11. Yes. Um, what thing is, usually we have two student assistants. Okay, but so far I have the name only of one of them. I'm not sure if she, you know, we had some issue. It, they were taken by some other uh, professors, so I we have only one. His name is Martin Martinusen. Okay, I'm going to put you here a picture so you can know who is he, and you can chase him. Remember, chase him first, and then you chase me, but first try with him. And um, the email is here. Okay, so I'm, he was already confirmed, but the other person not yet, and uh, I'm not sure what is the issue, but I'm going to get the information from Lisbeth uh, later this week, but we are going to have hopefully two, okay? <coughs> and um, another thing is that these are, you know, traditionally, they, at Dentinu, they like to have one day which is uh, exercise and one day which is theory. In my class, I like to bake both, okay, at the same time. So they are mixed all the time. You don't know exactly when we will have exercise, when we will have theory. That depends how much, how we are progressing in class, okay? And I think that's, to my, to my opinion, that's the best way. So just don't expect one day to have, you know, will be mixed exercise and, and theory. And this year, I will try to have some more class activities. Okay, I got the feedback from last year and previous years that you like to have more class activities. Okay, so we will try, you know, as the theory and covering all the all the pensum allows it to have some more sessions like that. And then on top of that, we are going to have the students are going to have some exercise sessions. Okay, and we will have them not this week, but after you know the the problems the um, the exercise are published. Okay, we are going to have it every week a session of some you know I think it usually is like three hours. Hold by. Every week. Okay, um, consultation with the students, assistant, they, it's usually during that time, or you can also send them an email if you have a question, maybe they have time to help you, but also be aware that they are on the, you know, they are on the last year, so they are finishing their, their master, and they might be also very busy. If you have to talk to me about something, a question about the course or something else, uh, you can do it after class, okay. 
or we can set up a date if you contact me by email. If something that you cannot discuss by email or you want to talk face to face, so send me an email. Okay, my email is milan.stanko at ntnu.no. <clears throat> okay, the evaluation. So far, clear? Yeah. We are going to have a uh, forty percent of the course. It's um, exercises, home exercises. And many of these exercises is are some that I start doing in class, or they are very similar to exercises I do in class. So that's why I ask you if you have questions or if you are, you know, just try to pay attention in class to the exercise especially. And if you have any question, just do it here, okay? Or you do it after class, because then on the exercise you might find, you know, you might have the same question. First, you, you're helping all your other friends or all the other classmates when you ask a question, you think maybe you know it's the only I'm the only one that has it, okay? But but truly, many other people might have the same question. And when you make it, you're helping the whole group, okay? They don't have to. They don't have. They kind of get an enlightenment. Then it's also nice when I do the exercise that you know it's not only me telling you what to do, but it's also we have some interaction that helps the learning process. Um, okay, and then it helps you at the end. The last thing is that it helps you for your grade. Because when you ask questions and then you have things clearer when you go yourself to make the exercise later. Okay, so for this, at least for these three reasons, try to, you know, uh, first be in class for, you know, for the sessions and also try to uh, have some interaction during the exercise. And we usually have around, um, it's around five sets. Okay, and each set might have like three problems. Okay, each. Three or four. And they are quite, uh, quite demanding. I like to change them from year to year. So there are some problems which are similar, but many problems are different. And uh, so first, you should take it very seriously. First, that accounts for 40% of your grade, okay? Which is nice if you make all of these exercises, you get um, kind of contributes to your grade. And then I can he sit here and you know tell you about many things and you can say, yes, I understand. But then it's only when you go and, try and sit and try to do things that actually you're challenging the knowledge that you got during class, okay, or that you read. That's actually when the learning process happens. When you are have to do it yourself, don't know how to do it, have to find the solution to the problem, have to think about it, have to digest it. So that's really the crucial part, I think, in this course. That's why we have so many exercises. Hmm? And it might be challenging sometimes, you know, usually we have like between two and three weeks to make them. Um, and sometimes also you have to tell me it's going to maybe overlap with some other exercise you have in another course. So if that happens, sometimes we have had like there are four courses that we have the deadline on the same day. So that's not good for you also. Okay, so let me know that if you are very stressed or you are under, you know, a lot of um, other things that you have to make, just let me know, okay? And we can, well, I can be flexible on the delivery date. But, um, so you have to deliver to, to get approval to, for the exam, to take the exam, you have to deliver, you have to do two things, you have to deliver all but one. That means four. And also at the same time, the compound grade 
has to be at least 20 out of 40 okay to be able to get to get access to the exam you see we're getting is getting crowded so we need a bigger bigger room okay and then so that's 40 percent any question there i think this year the delivery is going to be made through inspera okay not blackboard so i i will let you know because we are you know it's uh it's not only you who are victims of um you know changing the system and changing everything but it's also us so i'm not sure really how that works but i think the delivery of the exercise is going to be done through inspera not uh, blackboard but we will come to that uh, later okay and then we have 60 percent is the exam the final exam and this year we're going to try you know you're going to be like um you know this uh a rat laboratory to try the digital exam any of you have had it before digital exam you how did it go terrible, terrible. okay um so we're going to have it's going to be digital exam and we're going to have it in um let's see here the date is the 24th of May 2018 the room is going to be JC 23 in real fact okay and digital exam that means that you will be using the computer you're not going to be writing I think they allow sometimes to write on a paper but you will be using mainly the computer okay and one thing why it might work for our course before you had to the previous years all calculations were done manually you had to use the calculator and pen and paper okay but in class actually and during the exercise we are using very much excel okay for all of our calculations it's a very nice platform i'm going to talk a bit later about it but uh, so i have asked specifically that the exam will be done in excel that you have access to an excel sheet and then you start solving the exam in excel okay so that's why i think you might not have so many problems like if you had to because i heard that when you want to write equations for example it's a very big issue the system crashes it has a lot of bugs here you don't have to write too much equations but you have to solve things using excel sheets okay and i want to do the same in the exam you might have to sketch some things they say they have a good solution for that let's hope and maybe type some uh, some theoretical answers okay but not many the main core of the exam will be using excel hmm? any question no remember you have to ask if you have any question someone else might have it so yes what the egg team based okay we usually last year what we have done it depends on the size of the group but i think a good number is three per group because three still you can share the work if you have more then you have people sitting idle you know don't doing much if you have less then it becomes a bit too much so usually a good number is three Again, I'm going to put around three, so you don't take, you know, it has to be three, but around three. You can choose two, four, but is a good number, I think, to my opinion, is to use three. Okay, and for the exercises, we are going to have a penalty for late delivery. If you don't have a valid excuse or if you know of, of course if you are sick or if you have a major problem your excuse you can deliver later but if you don't have any excuse you just deliver late you're going to lose usually what we say you lose 20 percent every half a day of late delivery that's what we usually what i usually use so for example if it's 100 then if you deliver after half a day you have it will be evaluated over 80 and then 60 and then 40 and then after two days and a half you lose the whole grade so you have the option but try to deliver 
I actually try to make the amount of work that you can deliver in um, you know in the in the time. But try to deliver on time. Okay. Okay, here we have two, so it's Martin and one which is pending. Okay. Uh, a okay, mysterious uh, assistant that we don't know who he is or she is <coughs> okay so like I told you we're going to be using our main tools in the course are will be Excel and we're going to use not only Excel but we are going to use also BBA which is Visual Basic for applications And you complain, you might complain, you say, well, we already learned MATLAB, or I learned Python, or I learned C++, why don't we use that? Excel is something first, you have, all of you have license here from NTNU, and you probably have it on your computers. Maybe you use it or not, but you have it on your computers. Also, graphically, it's very intuitive. Okay, you put data on the cells, so you're actually looking at the data. MATLAB, some other languages, you have to go to some other area where you have to click and see actually what the variable has. Here in Excel, everything is very transparent. Okay? And the other thing is that it's very powerful on the programming side. It might not be a very efficient um, pro programming language, cannot have the lowest runtime, but you can do many things with Excel. Okay, even so many things that you can do in MATLAB or you can do in Python, you can do in Excel. Okay? And you have it, everybody has it on their computer. So we are going to be using Excel. And here, just a quick warning for people having, um, be careful how many of you are Mac users? Mac, only one, two, three, four, five, okay. Usually it works fine, okay, the Excel that you install by default on Mac. But sometimes you have a version like it's limited, doesn't have access to macro, or there are some, some issues there. So, you know, you will see with, with the exercise, you will see if you have any problems, okay? A workaround is to install the right version of uh, Excel on, on, the, on your Mac. Or another option is that you install, maybe already you have it, it's a secondary operating system on your Mac like a virtual machine. Okay, so be careful and please check, you know, that your version um, has BBA functionality. And then the other thing that I recommend if you have experienced a lot of issues is just to install a virtual machine. with Windows. Okay, or you can use also the computers in the computer lab. Okay, so you have options and you have solutions, but just be careful, some of you, we have had some people that have no problem, some people that have some problems, and some people that are just, you know, want to crash the computer to the wall. Okay, so we have the whole range, but everything goes like, it's more into the people that don't have any problem. So, how many of you are familiar with Excel? BBA, one, two, two, three, four. Okay, so no, don't worry, we are going to go from the bottom and building up. It's not difficult to learn, but uh, okay, so I, now I know that you, you know, we're, we have to take it slowly at the beginning. Then some other tools that we're going to use are um, a software called IPM and I think that stands for Integrated Petroleum Management and this is a suite that has many different tools inside and but we are going to use mainly one called Prosper, one program called Prosper and one called GAP. 
for those we have limited licenses so it's not something that you can install on your computers but something that we're going to do here in the lab usually in this p2 this lab here that is on the on to our left and then we have another tool so that tool is to simulate or to make models of the production system okay make models of the production system and calculate rates calculate pressures calculate temperatures okay all different things a long time also then we're going to use another software called HiSys that is a process simulator you can use it also to simulate parts of the production system but the main focus of this software is for process modeling any of you knows how to use it, ISIS? No? Okay, that's the useful thing is that we have a lot of licenses and you can use it almost with no limitation. And um, you can ask, I think it's a bit difficult to install it on your computer, but you can use farm.ntnu.no. All of you use farm, I guess, or have used it before. So you just go to this website farm, you log with your UNTNU credentials, and then you get a link that actually allows you to run, they have a few programs, and you are running it not on your computer, but on a virtual computer, on another computer here in GLOSS, okay, in GLOSS Hub. Uh, so that's an option to, to use it. Okay, and that's more or less everything we're going to use. Of course, you are you know you are free to use if you want to solve the exercise you want to use some other software but you know i encourage you to use excel um you know it's not like i'm going to forbid you to use anything else but i'm saying well to keep the same in line with the course you can you can use uh, you you can use excel okay now we need i need something from you i need three very um, brave uh, guys or girls to you know for be part of the reference group this is very boring but we have to do it otherwise they will put me in jail or something i don't know what happens so we need three three brave you know that are willing to you don't have to sacrifice much okay you have to meet with me we have to have three meetings uh, along the semester and you have to maybe talk to your friends and say you know how what good things you have seen in the course and what are the bad things you have seen in the course again you have to tell me that and then i can have to adjust it the course along the semester so any volunteers or because otherwise i have to choose by hand okay but i have to choose well this this person this person and this person and that person might not be happy because they no no one use okay your names please Okay, you have to say, you have to tell me either letter by letter or I give you a paper and you write me. So to all the rest, um, if if you feel like you have a problem, for example, I'm going too fast in the class, or you think that there is not enough time to to absorb the exercise, or any any issue, uh, please talk to this person. You can send, of course, always an email to me directly. But you can tell to you know these guys are brave uh, uh, reference group, and then they will tell me directly. Okay, we can take actions, some actions uh, along the semester. Thank you. So now let's see if I understand your handwriting. So we have Petra. Two H. 2H, yeah? It's like C H A T. Okay. 
ok đấy NSK ai Yes, okay. Okay, so they are going to be the main contact person if you want, you know, usually we don't have many issues. Um, but you know, if you if you want, you have a contact point, and they are, you know, I I talk to them at least we have to talk three times a semester. Okay, we should have a meeting, then beginning, meet, and end. Um, okay, just to make you aware a bit, um, on Mondays we're going to have there might be some guest lectures on Monday. Uh, some Mondays, let's put it like that, some Mondays and it's going to be one hour usually from 14.15 to 3 and it's a person from the industry, from Statoil, from Gasco, from let's see what we are going to get this semester and it's going to talk about topics related to our course okay uh, but maybe flow assurance maybe gas distribution system different things but it depends you know if they are willing to come usually many of these people they sit in Bergen on Stavanger or Oslo so they have to take a flight they have to be here and then they have to go back so uh, not everyone can you know can can take their, the time but we are going to have it we hope hope to have it and uh, it's going to be within uh, you know in during class time and of these lectures also to you know we are going to say that you have to um, you have to assist at least to 50 percent of them okay well, again to have access to the exam And one of the reasons is not, well, I think it's also important, and maybe some of the questions we have, uh, we will include in the exam. But the main thing is that these people, they take their time, you know, they, they take the time of the company, they take, uh, you know, the effort to come here and to, to give us a lecture. And then it's very sad sometimes that they come and they're only 10 students, okay? That doesn't feel very, very, you know, that's not very nice. So uh, just by putting that requirement, I hope that, you know, when we have these lectures, you, you will come here and just, you know, he has an audience to, or she or she or he has an, have an audience to, to, to give the lecture. Okay. So now that's, uh, I think that's the boring part. Uh, yes. Any questions so far? These are like, no, nothing to do with. Technic technical stuff, just the boring part. Any questions? Is it clear? Yeah, do you agree with the plan? Have any comments? Have any objections? No? I know you have the objection with uh, the digital exam, but we hope, you know, it's going, they promise it's going to work fine. So you can also help me, it's not only you, okay? We can complain together and, and try to improve the situation, so. Okay, so uh, the reference material that we are going to use they are basically uh, two books and I'm not telling you to buy them because we really use only a, sp a small part of these books and actually I'm going to cover them in class Okay, one of them is this book, Hydrocarbon Exploration and Production, and uh, by Jan, Cook, and Graham. And the other book, it's, uh, let's see if I have the cover here. No. The other book is called um, Well Performance.
by Michael Golan. Professor Golan, actually, he was the one that started this course in, I think it was 2007. He, you know, saw the need for some, you know, a, a platform like that. You will see a bit later what is the content and what is the intention. But we, he saw the need and he created the course and he retired in uh, 2014, but you can still see him walking around the, the building. So doing also we do some work from time to time. And I will find the cover to put it here later. So these are the two books. And then I have a set of notes or a compendium by uh, Milan. I have made a compendium with some of the most relevant um, that we are going to cover in class anyhow. But if you want, there is something that was not clear from the notes. You watch the video and there is something still that doesn't click. You can go and check these notes that you know that they more or less cover uh, with a bit more content uh, what what is what we are going to cover here in class. And I'm not going to put the whole compendium at once, but I'm going to be publishing chapter by chapter like every week as we you know we okay. Just before we start and I show you what we are going to cover and then we cover some some uh, so the plan for today's I show you like the the how you call the game plan I will show you now what are we going to cover and uh, and then we're going to cover a little bit of the you know of the content but before that uh, so how many of you are from the international master program in petroleum How many of you are from the master program, five-year master program in petroleum? Okay. And the rest? Non-petroleum. Non-petroleum from natural gas, for example? Okay. Natural gas, and you are coming from? Petroleum. The petroleum from? Norwegian, two, uh, two years, not international. Two years. Okay. So you were before in uh, Bergen, or? No, actually I'm from Syria. But in the same course okay um when who is you so you are from natural gas yeah. okay someone else from outside that doesn't have like uh, you like I'm, I'm asking because some like the people that you know they are taking the international the five year they already have like they already know more have an overview of the petroleum like workflow petroleum industry etc but people that come from outside for example you might not be very aware what is the drilling process, what is uh, seismic, etc. So that's that's why I'm asking to get your background, more or less. But you, so it's only the two of you. Suppose that, uh, you have some more because like we have seven of us in gas tech. Okay, seven or... Around yeah. seven people because this course is mandatory for us. Okay, so you're stuck with me now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so especially for you, if you have any question about you know some general thing that is not that I just maybe I will mention it and everybody says oh yes yes and you stay like what is that so you have to stop me and tell me okay please explain a bit so I can get some background um, what it is okay so the the topics that we are going to cover are this here on this table and the way I have put them is I say the topic the title of the topic and some sub uh, topics inside then at which level we are going to cover this topic and then if we are going to have an exercise or not remember the exercise helps you to fix that knowledge in your brain and you you know you will keep it with you for a longer time engineering skills tells you what generic tools or skills you're going to learn on that topic that you can also use in different things okay not only on that particular topic and the tool means which main computational tool you're going to use to do the exercise or we are going to do here in class to make the exercise okay so let's start maybe with the left first I'm going to say and that I will start today and we are going to go tomorrow it's a bit heavy topic because it's a lot of 
me talking and you you know just listening passive growing roots but um but it's very important just to give you the full picture what are where we are what are we going to cover and how the whole process looks like and then we are going to start as a semester progresses to go into some activities that are done into each each this big process then um life cycle field development workflow more or less the same and then we are going to go to some specific tasks that are done when you develop a field okay so one of them is how the to perform uh, reserve estimation using probability considering uncertainty and then maybe this you will cover it or you have already seen it someplace but it's um, to, to make some cost calculation and economical calculation on the that are done when you develop a field and on the first one is just appreciation I say will just show you you know not slides but show you like give you information, show, tell you how does it look like, but you don't do much else than that. Then the second one, you actually try to do, you know, you get into the level of learning how to do things, learning how it, how it works, you know, and how to do things, and actually you have the skill to go and do it yourself. Hmm? So that's what I mean by configuration and design. And we are going to have a, an exercise uh, for that. Then I'm going to talk about the layout of the field and uh, some offshore and onshore field architecture and layout of production systems. And we're going to talk very much about the central um, uh, structure in a production system that is called the production manifold and about pigging, which is something that is commonly done. And here we, don't ha we are not going to have any calculation, but what is interesting is that you have to you know get get to see how to understand how the system works okay no so not only that i show you okay this is how the system looks like and you then forget and you come back and then okay you know i, I cannot do much else but actually that you yourself understand what every part is doing in the system and you can reproduce take a pen and you yourself can sketch it with your own understanding how you know the system work looks like and how the system works that's what I mean by configuration. Then we're going to talk about uh, dynamic mar marine structures and it's their dynamics. Because uh, for offshore field, it's very important the, the marine environment, okay, the marine, the, 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 the marine conditions. So we're going to talk how these things affect which concept or which structure you use to develop a particular field. Okay. Then we're going to go to the those of you you know studying petroleum and studying flow that they think this is very interesting see how is the performance of the full system considering field and considering wells and considering pipelines um some concept called how do i define how much i'm going to produce and then how to verify that actually i can produce that rate uh, then to analyze how the flow, how much I'm going to flow from each well and how that's going to interact between each other in the whole system. And the flow in networks, you will see you know, later what is a network, but basically is a structure that commingles the production from all different wells and takes it to the facilities. Then we're going to talk about um, flow assurance. That is a very big issue in an offshore field. You have there are some things that are going to either stop production or that are going to cause delays in production. They're going to block the production. So these are things that we have to, you know, handle very early and that we have to, you know, be, be aware of them. Then uh, we're going to talk about this ESP is boosting in wells. It's called electric submersible pump. How do they work? Um, by the way, have you seen it before? Any other course, ESPs? Okay, how, how do they look like? How do they work? How do we use them in the production system and how you perform a design during the field life? Then we talk about some other very relevant topic, which is subsea boosting. It's, uh, you know, I think from the 6th 
uh, fields that are going to be developed that were sent last year, I think almost all of them are subsea. Okay, you have no new platforms, all of them are tieback subsea. So the, it looks like the industry, at least in Norway, is moving subsea. And the booster, subsea booster, is going to become like a, a more common element in this system. So it's good that you know, you know, how does it look like, what does it do, and more importantly, how can you verify the design, okay, when you are designing a field. Then we're going to talk a bit, very briefly, about data management and allocation then about how do we optimize our system production optimization and then lastly we are going to talk a bit about integrated asset modeling and all around you know this will be something that we are going to mention all along the the, the course so you know it's already three so let's take a break you know i think you're already feeling um, uh, sleepy so and we come back come back in 15 minutes and we continue the, the class <laughs> Okay, we are back. Um, yes, we have an issue. Um, some people from from the natural gas program, they say they take all of their classes there, okay, in, uh, in Glushagen. And they have to come here, run, and go back, and run, and go back. So they were wondering, asking all the rest, if it will be okay to change to move the hour of the lecture tomorrow to 8 instead of 10. If you have any, if you have any other class, or if not, then from three to eight. Yeah, make it earlier. But we have actually. Uh, you have something else. Okay. Sorry. So, any other option? No. Um, is it is it possible to suggest on Thursday four to uh, two to four? Thursday two to four. Yes. Or Friday eight to ten. Two to four. No? Yes. Huh? How do we? We go to class. Huh? All of us. <laughs> well, we might, but I think some people. For is it possible for Thursday two to four? Okay. You have class. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Difficult. Well, we. Well, you know, I will be recording the lecture, so if you come a bit later, you can catch up on that. Uh, but you will have to do some exercise running back and forth. So that's the, uh, and if you have to leave like five minutes or 10 minutes earlier, then I think that we'll have to, to do. Because I think it might be a bit too complicated to find the time that will, you know, suitable for everyone. So what she, the second one that she said, Friday from eight to 10, is that also, For you, it's fine. Subsea? Okay. Okay, let's keep that in ice for now. You make the effort, but let's keep that in ice and see if later we can find. I can send you a. We can make a doodle to see if you know some times of the of the of the week and if you are willing to change. Okay, but for now you will have just to make uh, some training and run back and forth. So we see that the guys from from natural gas they are extremely motivated to come to class because they have to run back and forth they have to do a marathon every <laughs> sorry <laughs> yeah so uh, here i have listed some topics we are going to need these topics in class and of course some of you haven't seen them so we are going to do a very short introduction in class but if you want to prepare some of you have asked like you know i want to prepare a bit better 
or is there any material that I can check so you can see some of these topics. So I have put here a material balance we're going to use and that's the, this is the course of uh, Professor Whitson. But of course I'm going to give a very short introduction to the equation that we're going to use. Then reservoir simulation fundamentals, flow tables. I'm also going to give an introduction. Any of you that is interested? This is uh, Professor Kleppe, who is taking this course this semester. One, two, three. Okay, quite a, a lot. So, uh, well, inflow models. Uh, this is by uh, Professor Ashheim, who. I think who has taken the course before, too. Okay. Uh, fluid phase. That's again Professor Whitson. Then uh, black oil model. That's also Whitson. Uh, single and multi-phase flow in pipes. That's uh, Professor Larson, and I think you have. Those people coming from GLUS, they, there is uh, another course by Professor Nidal. How many of you are taking that course? Nidal, one. It's called Multiphase Transport. And it's also covered by Harald Ashheim. Uh, again, Larsen, Larsen, and Larsen. This. So we're going to use some of that. So if you want to refresh it, if you want to be a bit more prepared, you know, you, these are some topics that you can refresh. But if not, don't worry, we are going to try to cover them here in class and we will go, you know, at a uh, okay pace. Then um, introduction to subsea systems and subsea boosting also is a bit related. Uh, so that's Professor Sangensland and Jashvik. Yes, big. Then uh, this is uh, Professor Bradbolt, and then we have this is uh, Professor Stovas. So it's just to tell you also how we are interacting with the other courses okay what kind of things are we taking from the different courses um, especially for for the students from here okay yes okay so now let's cover a bit of theory today and tomorrow uh, so I will start you know let, let's see how long it takes to to um, to cover some some theory so first i want to tell you where are we located where are or is this course located okay and we are located in what we call e and p okay which stands for exploration and production or also we can call it upstream. Okay, if we have a drawing, I think I have one here. Okay, of the whole system. Okay, so exploration first, we try to find resources, we try to you know, find accumulations uh, in the underground that we think have either gas or oil that we can exploit. And then after that starts a phase of building the field. That's what we are going to cover in this course. And then you have the field and actually are extracting and pumping out and flushing out everything that it has inside. Trying, you know, as much as possible to recover what is in the ground. So that's actually what we call upstream exploration and production from this side to the left okay then you have some other things like you have to you have to transport these fluids you have to process these fluids at the end you have to maybe refine it you want to make something else out of it okay maybe it's more profitable if you you know extract and then sell it for different purposes 
and then at the end that comes to our homes that comes to our cars that comes to the bus that you're using that comes to the to to give the electricity that you are using so that's the whole picture from you know there is nothing all the way to your homes okay or to the to the market and we are just looking we're not going to go into anything else we're just looking on this side okay just to be uh, clear and then um then let's talk about you know so this this let's you know field development and operations okay. so we are going to talk about two distinct things number one is the development okay that we are the problem with development is that I have very few or no infrastructure existing infrastructure there so everything is very open everything is very flexible I can take any decision I want okay and but the problem is you have to cope with a lot of uncertainty so high uncertainty in many things in in when are the things that I order going to be delivered what is the price of the market of this thing that I'm going to sell how much do I have in the underground you know what kind of properties does it have uh, you know what what uh, what is the the aquifer how strong the aquifer is many many different things and I have to take a lot of decisions based on that so um, so like uh, little or okay empty we call it empty sometimes we can use you will see that we can use for example a neighboring field or neighboring installations so in that case you have already is not completely empty but you already have a good starting point you already have something that you can use but usually if you start from scratch you have nothing and then you have to build everything you have empty start point so you have is you have a lot of decisions to take so high flexibility and a lot of decisions to take but also you have to take these decisions that they involve billions of dollars okay a lot of money that any of us will ever make in our lifetime unless you have here the next uh, Zuckerberg or someone that we cannot neglect that possibility but you have to spend all of that money you have to take big decisions that involve high risk with very little information that's the main point that I want to convey here on the development part and the idea is that you want to make things optimum right if you invest that big amount of money you want to say well I want to make the system to fit perfectly 100% to what I need but you cannot because you don't know how your system looks like until you start producing it and we will see you know we're going to focus here on this course in offshore uh, production and we will see it's very different an offshore field than an onshore field onshore field maybe you can you can some some cases okay you can afford to do it slowly slowly you start drill some wells you start producing start getting some revenue and slowly slowly you find out what you have below the surface and at the end you make kind of a more optimum uh, development offshore is not like that offshore if you are going to start producing you have to have already everything from the start or almost everything from the start so it's like you know a big investment you have to take big decisions and you have very you know um, but you still want to make it optimum okay so this is saying evaluating valuation of several options okay and find best suitable solution at the end the main the main objective of the development is to increase the value to the shareholders okay to give the most or the highest value to the shareholders of the company and by you know uh, avoiding or avoiding at all cost damages to the to, to the 
to the environment and damages to the people. Okay, to make it in a sustainable and environmentally responsible manner. Okay, shareholders, the owners of the company in a sustainable and environmentally and then we are going to cover also some part on the operation operation is a different mindset you already locked with a system you already trapped it's like you're already you know i i arrive here and i have to work this is what i have i have to work with this okay so it's a existing system then i'm locked or i'm with its deficiencies and also its advantages okay so i have to say i have to cope with the deficiencies okay and i have to profit or i have to take advantage of you know its characteristics or of its um Also, I'm looking for to optimize the production. That means that I want to reduce many things. One of these things is that the, the, the cost, the lifting cost per barrel, how much does it take for me to take the barrel from the subsurface all the way to the market? I want to reduce that number because if I reduce that cost, then my revenue will be higher. Uh, and then I have some other issues like I have troubleshooting Okay, things start to fail, so I have to 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 fix the problem. There are some unexpected events that I have to 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 address. So maintenance, maybe I have to make a major decision to you know to in, to increase the the production. So the modifications, etc. And we are going. You remember, I, I will change in class from one to the other. You know, I, I will let you know more or less, but I'm going to change. We are going to change very dynamically from one to the other. So if any time it gets confusing, just, you know, stop me and ask me, uh, you know, to, to clarify. Okay, but there are two different, one of them, you already have a system, you're locked with that system and you have to do the best you can with it. And the other one, you don't have anything you have to take major decisions and they have to be the best that you can do, but you are bound by uncertainty. Okay. So, then we are going to talk about the life cycle of a hydrocarbon field. So then we have, first of course we have, you know, we, we, we included also here, we have exploration. Okay. Let's make it like a box. Okay. And then at some point in the exploration we have, what do we have? We have something that is very a very important milestone, which is the discovery. Okay, we made a discovery on the exploration. Then comes another stage which we call appraisal. And here we try to get more information about that discovery that we just made, about that possible potential accumulation I'm going to have in the subsurface. Then after that comes 
the planning. Of course, at any point in the appraisal, I can take the decision if to go for it or not. I have planning of the field. Then I have the construction and execution. And then at some point here, just before, we have another milestone, which is start of production. And then we have uh, basically production or operation, operational phase. And then many traditional textbooks they say well that's where you stop okay you have all of these stages but now it's becoming more and more relevant and it's important that you also create some awareness of that that we have another stage which which is called abandonment and decommissioning okay And that's extremely important. Some places we say you have to leave everything the way it was originally. And that's something that is cost a lot of money. It has a lot of challenges that you have to solve. And there are also big opportunities. Okay, Some of you might say, well, I want to be a reservoir engineer, a production engineer. But maybe you will see that you can find some very interesting and very profitable opportunities in the decommissioning uh, business. Hmm? So that's more or less the whole picture of the field, okay? Exploration, I make a discovery, then appraisal, I try to get more information about that discovery. Then I go on the planning phase, if I say, well, do I have or not something that is worth developing and how I'm going to develop it in the best possible way. After that, I have the construction and execution. I have actually, I'm building the field, I'm gathering all the people I need, all the experts I need to run this field, and then I start producing. And this production, this is a process that might take around from here to here is like 30 years. Okay. A field might be producing typically everything between 15, 5 years all the way to 30 years. And actually this phase that we see, okay, here it takes a lot of space, a lot of time. Actually this part should be done in between 4 and 5 years. Okay, so I'm going to, what we are going to do now is I'm going to go more in detail how this process is done, okay, because we are going to focus mainly on this part, on the planning, and on these three blocks here, and uh, how is the process executed, that's what I'm going to tell you now, that's a bit heavy, but you know, I hope you have, you are full, full of energy because it's the fir first day, so you can, you can take it. So we are going to talk about the field development process. And I'm going to take, you know, instead of using my handwriting, I'm going to take a figure I made. By the way, it's going fine. Do you understand my handwriting? Okay enough? Okay. Okay, so that's more in detail. Not this one. Okay, all the steps, it might change from company to company, might change from country to country, but roughly the process looks like that. Okay, what is shown in the in the in the screen. So first you have a pre-exploration phase. And pre-exploration is you try to gather where it might be worth to do exploration, actually. You have some indication 
you know, where I will go looking for, for oil or for gas, the pre-exploration phase. Then after you have defined that area, then you perform exploration and appraisal. And there at some point, hopefully you have a discovery. You have made a discovery and you suspect and you have an idea that there are significant accumulations of hydrocarbons there. Okay? Then comes the way this process is structured is called um, stage gates. That's a, a project management uh, method that is, you know, very extended in this so project management process. Okay, it's basically a strategy that is called stage gate process. Okay, it was invented by. I think in the 1940s was um, I think actually was in the US some for big chemical projects in chemical and mechanical engineering. I think then NASA used it and then it started to get more and more expanded. So the, the main idea is that you have a process and it looks more or less like that. And then you have in certain parts of the process, you have a, something called decision gate. This DG stands for decision gate. where a number of individuals can be a committee can be you know the board member of the company they have to take a decision with some information that is available some indicators some things that many people have been working on hard to get these numbers they have to take a decision if to continue if to stop if to abandon or if to do some more work hmm? Okay. So here you have the first main decision that you have to make, that is, you have to say if what you have is commercial or not. Okay, if what you have, with all the data that you have gathered, with all the activities you have performed, is commercial or not. And you have to take, you will see, we will see now what do we have in this step, more or less. What activities do we have in these two blocks? But basically, you have to say, do I want to continue with this field or not? Do I want to continue with this discovery? And then after that's done, it's like a gate opens. And then I have another big process where I have to say, well, yes, it is commercial, but you have to see how you're going to develop it. Okay. What, what options you have for development? So for that, you have this phase, which is called uh, project planning. And it starts with feasibility studies. And you have another decision gate. Along the process, you will have decision gates and you have different levels of complexity and different levels of information which is available. Okay. Concept planning, DG2, pre-engineering, DG3, this is more detail. Here you're trying just to find blue sky ideas to develop the field. Everything is very, you don't have much information, for example, about cost. Okay, You don't know how much it's going to cost. You say, well, I'm going to buy, for example, a platform for this field. But then you find out later that the platform of that size, of those characteristics, with that number of wells actually will cost this sum of money, which is very high. And then you have to say, I have to find another way. Hmm? So that's what, in this stage, you have very, you know, information with a lot of uncertainty, and you try to reduce it along, you know, a, a long time. And that's actually then DG3 is very important as that's actually where the the company has to submit um, has to submit um, you know we're going to go now in detail one by one but it's just to give you an overview has to submit the plan PDO stands for plan for development and operations okay I have to tell not only for the company but for the government to all the partners to everyone they have to be aware how do you plan to develop this field Okay, what, for example, uh, what are the main conditions of the field? How does it look like from what you have managed to gather? And how are you going to produce it? How are you going to develop? How is it going to affect the, the neighboring areas? Hmm? And then comes the phase after you have that PDO. And so here it depends if, if you go for it, 
if you know here the government has to approve that plan and say okay we agree on the way that you're going to develop it then comes the execution of the project where i have to make all detailed engineering what i have done here gathering you know information trying to find rough dimensions of the equipment here i have to do very detailed and i have to find the specifications for every particular element in the system to send it to to build it to send it to to commission it etc then construction testing and startup and then i have dg4 and you see well why do i have a decision gate if the field is already built okay that sounds like a bit weird but if there is some major thing that you say well major flaw during testing or during something that you feel that the project cannot go forward then you have to take the decision to stop okay and maybe review part of the part of the execution that's going to cost a lot of money so usually here we don't want to to have any problems so everything has to be planned properly here and then you have operations and abandonment and decommissioning So that's called stage gate process and keep in mind that with time if we have an axis here I say here time the this we can say is the number of decisions to take okay initially everything is open I can take a lot of decisions and the flexibility of the system but with time is going to go down until I'm locked my system is done I cannot do anything else but with the information actually is the opposite this is available information about the okay actually it's growing with time and you don't have to say well it's only about the reservoir or it's only about it's about everything about cost the manufacturer tells you, well, this platform might cost between two and three billion, for example. Okay, and then with time they realize when they start building it, well, actually it's going to cost two point three one four five, etc. They are start narrowing down on the on the real number, and that's a problem, and we have to you know cope with the nature of this of this process. If I forgot something, okay. So, see, just, just be aware you have to, you know, learn about these, these words that are used, but just I, I will say for now focus on the bottom okay that's giving you the main activity that is happening on that phase okay first we have to identify a business case then we have to plan the project then we have to execute the project and then we have to operate and abandon and decommission okay so this this uh, one two three four five is what you have to to keep in mind so let's talk about um, about the business case identification okay, and then we have here the pre-exploration And basically the main the main idea is to say what we call scouting. Okay, that we're trying to gather collecting information about areas of interest. And you have to also take into account you know to define what is an area of interest what actually you know where do I want to produce oil or where do I want to produce gas you have to take 
many factors into account. You have to take the political, you have to take political, if maybe you are in a, going inside a, a region or inside a country that has, you know, is known for, you know, some, I don't know, corruption issues or is, has a dictatorship, okay, so you have to, has to be, um, the, the companies usually they have some some principles okay and if they these companies they never work with corrupt countries or they never work with dictatorships to avoid problems so that they will never go into an area like that um, so you have uh, political things you have also a technical part that depends on the geology existing geology, how much information you have about the, the structure of the subsurface. Um, then you have geographical, okay, social part, um, environmental. An example is uh, the Barents Sea, for example, the Arctic area. Some companies they say, well, if we go inside one of these areas, we will have too much public exposure. You know, we are going to have some backslash from environmental groups. Our aim is, our, we are going to look bad. So they decide, well, we don't want to deal with any of these things. We don't do just don't do Arctic exploration, environmental uh, issues. Okay, also other things are, so that's how you define areas of interest, so also taxation, okay, how how much you're getting out of the, you know, for, for the effort you're putting from the oil that you're selling, um, we already talked about politics, this is government, um, uh, also uh, personal security for example if you are in an area where you know you might get ki kidnapped or it is uh, next to a war uh, you might be hit by a, a rocket for example personal um, security okay and also one thing that is very important is that what is the previous experience of the company? Previous experience. Okay. They, of course, they try to find things that are within your, the, you know, your, your portfolio, your, um, your area where you have done things before. Okay. Then you have to find after all of these, you know, constraints and configurations and etc. Then you have to find after you have an area. You have to get pre-exploration access. And what is the meaning of pre-exploration? Exploration is everything that I do just by not doing drilling, okay? Just by performing seismic and drilling shallow wells so there are some countries give pre-exploration access to perform only these two things no drilling is allowed you just you just perform uh, and uh, this is usually not done by this so just to put a comment here this is usually not done by the oil company or by the this is done by another by um, scouting companies That then they sell the data to a to a bigger company, okay? to uh, to Statoil or to to uh, Chevron. They 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 buy this data from companies that they have done some scouting in the region. Okay? Then you have the main exploration. So before exploring, you have to get a production license. Okay, 
well for of course you have to you know you're going to get different possible potential locations and then you have to decide one so that's we call identify prospects hmm? how many alternatives you have where it might be profitable to to do it then get a production license and the licenses usually let me show you a figure the government comes and they say well we divide the map where you know the areas that are interesting where we think oil might be this is uh, Norway we are someplace here okay and offshore Norway then what they do is that they map and they subdivide different regions okay different boxes and then they open I think in Norway is twice or th three times a year I'm, I think it's twice and they say well now it's open and you can you can ask for a production license in any one of these available uh, uh, areas okay. this case is from the 2016 I think this was in February last year uh, two years ago and the blocks you know they might look a bit different they might have names but usually they have numbers and you say well I apply for an you know production license in in one of these uh, blocks and this the the thing about this production license is that it's exclusive okay no one else before the pre-exploration they can give it to to different companies they can be exploring running seismic in this box okay in this but after you get a production license no one else can go inside okay it's only you that control everything that is happening on that block okay it's exclusive that's the the meaning of of exclusive okay so it's called here at least in Norway it's called um, licensing round that happens according to licensing round I forgot you know exactly let's see if I say here someplace no okay. and is they open what they say APA that stands for awards in predefined areas hmm? they open certain areas and maybe you remember maybe not there was a lot of controversy I think it was two years ago when they opened some blocks in the in the Barents Sea okay in the north in the Arctic area they open it and then the you know there was a lot of noise politicians start to move and also you know journalists and also a uh, greenpeace etc so that it might be a sensitive okay it's not so easy to say which blocks do i open and which blocks do i keep okay it's, it's something not, not so simple and here you start to pay after you get a production license okay you start to pay so the the costs are um I think the first year is uh, 34,000 year one okay which you say well it's not too much knock per square kilometer year two is um, 68,000 knock per square kilometer and then year three is hundred and thirty seven thousand knock so you see it's increasing so wh why is that why do you think it's increasing uh, year to year well they want to put pressure it's not like you're going to go and you're going to just keep all of these like in storage okay you're going to sit on them and wait you know for a company to tell you can I explore because if you have the exclusive production license you decide what to do with it you can go to another company and you say can you do you want to explore here you know we think we have prospects so this puts some pressure this increase in <coughs> price puts some pressure to the company don't just sit and do nothing okay you have actually to do something with the license you have and that something is do exploration okay so I'm not sure exactly what's the final amount, the size of these blocks changes, but it will be nice if some of you, you know, you want to, if you are maybe a Friday night, you don't know, you're bored, you're sitting at home, don't know what to do, so you can go and check what is the size of block 6601, and then we can have a number, you know, how much 
is that per year how much the company has to pay <coughs> okay so then comes the 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 next phase yes then comes the next phase which is the exploration and here I can use all kind of methods I want remember drilling usually is very costly it's you know it's it's so we try to get most information possible from things that are not drilling and we're going to soon take a break after I finish writing this one so you perform geological studies okay try to make an interpretation based on neighboring fields based on the geology of the region trying to find out what kind of structures you have uh, in the subsurface then you have geophysical surveys Uh, seismic then you have exploration drilling and from here you can do many things when you start drilling okay you can actually make core sampling that you can on the drilling when you're drilling you take actually a sample of the formation and you can verify the structure the sequence of different structures you have and with that you can verify the idea you had in mind or the model you had in mind of the subsurface um, you can do a core sampling you can make uh, wall sampling okay you cannot take um, kind of a very simple very primitive schematic is that you drill like that on the formation and you take a piece of core but another way is that you can also scrap the wall and can get some information. Also, another way is to analyze cuttings. Okay. The cuttings are all the, you know, when you when you crush, if you have your hole and you crush it, you get all of these particles, okay, that are you flush them out with some liquid and you analyze what are you getting in this uh, this um, cuttings uh, then you perform fluid samples and if that's very interesting I th maybe I can show you later a video then you perform uh, wireline logging okay. you put inside the well lower uh, Kind of with a cable with a wire you put a and then that emits a signal and then detects somehow what you have after you know uh, back of the wall and uh, then you perform the lastly is the productivity test it's not it's not only enough to see you know that you see that the formation looks <coughs> okay everything that you assume that for example the you know the water is where it should be the gas is where it should be but basically the most important is to get information on how good that formation can produce because theoretically you can go to a to a petrophysic petrophysicist and you can show him okay how much is this field going to produce and he can use a model and he can tell you well it's going to produce that many virals per day but then for some reason when you put it in production it might give you something completely different because this guy was doing based on a model okay and the best thing is to have a measurement that really tells you how much that field can produce okay let's take a break and uh, let's say 15 minutes and we come back for the last part Okay, and after that, um, you actually have, you know, the most important event of that phase, which is the discovery, right? And after you have the discovery, you have to perform an assessment of the discovery. Remember, now we are talking about the business identification um case okay identification of business case 
assessment of the discovery and here comes a few things that you have to make it's um, you have to make um, um, something that we are going to do here in class is probabilistic reserve estimation Okay, we're going to have an exercise, you're going to have an exercise on that, and we're going to do it in class also. Then um, you have to, also something important to say is that most of the decisions, a big factor, I show you, you know, social, economical, environment, previous experience, but really the main thing or the main factor that determines which you know, if to go or not, is money, okay? Is evaluation of the resources. And that, there are very different methods, very different ways to do it, but the, one of the main ones, and one that almost everyone uses, is NPV, net present value. Okay, so you have to assign a number. If you say you make a discovery very early, you have to assign a number to that discovery, a number to that field. And based on that, in every decision gate, really is the economic part that has a big weight in the in the decision okay so we'll see now you know tomorrow how you know you you make that evaluation there are some of you taking petroleum economics right how many just for curiosity okay <laughs> so you have to correct me if i make any mistake on the on the economical part um yeah, so then you have to uh, perform, and in this case it's a very simple, a simplified economic valuation of the resources. Okay. And then you have to perform, sometimes you perform appraisal. Okay. That is basically to drill more wells exploration wells okay. to get more information about the sub subsurface structure to get more information about the extent okay and to get more information about what you have above and below if it's contained if you have an aquifer if you have uh, different things and you can also perform seismic okay remember seismic usually you make kind of in a line, okay, and you, you go with the boat on one direction, another direction, and you use certain separation in between. But if you find have a finding here, for example, then you can refine and run the lines closer to each other hmm, to get more kind of more resolution on the, on the information. Seismic. And then, um, so some things that you are trying to find here are the extent of the reservoir. Okay, might be that you were lucky, found, you know, a, an accumulation, but at the end it's very small, so it's not economic. Uh, you're trying to find the uh, fault communication. If there is a fault, you want to know if it's completely sealing or if it's uh, letting some fluid through. Uh, aquifer uh, type and behavior. And another thing that you you want is the water oil contact. That stands for water oil <coughs> contact. And the gas oil content. Okay, one of them is the extension from the top. If you see from the top, how you know uh, what area does it occupy, but also on the depth. Okay, how how thick it is. And then this is we are rich DGO DG zero. Okay, and then you have different options. Here you can say, and this also abbreviation you have to learn, okay, SOC is called Statement of Commerciality. You have different options. You issue, uh, issue a 
SOC is called Statement of Commerciality. Okay. You can decide also to perform more appraisal. For example, if if you the the interpretation and is the subsurface is correct, then you have you know a very high revenue, five billion dollars is a very profitable project. But if your interpretation was wrong, it might be minus, okay, minus one. It might be just a loss. So in that case, they say, well, let's do some more appraisal. Let's invest some more wells to drill these wells and to see if really you know we have just to verify your assumption, just to verify your model. Um, then you have, you can use weight, sit and wait. Okay, you found something, but maybe the price is very low, so you want to sit and just wait, hold it until the price goes up. Maybe there is some negotiation maybe you're waiting the government there is going to be a change in government okay so maybe the new government will change and relax put better taxation conditions so there are some reasons why you want to wait uh, you can also sell the discovery if you find it you can partner up you can if you're a small company that doesn't have enough resources to develop this field you can say go to statoil and say you know, I have this field, I found this, it looks very nice, you know, I sell it to you, you have to give me a share or whatever. Or the last option is relinquish, you return the license to the government. That's the last option. I found something or I didn't find anything, you know, I, I don't think it's worth developing. So also keep something in mind up to this point, all of that. I don't have any revenue, okay? And it will be like that until I reach operations. So it's a very strong, you know, four years, five years of heavy expenditure, exp expenditure, okay? Maybe one of these fields might cost $100 million to drill, one of these exploration wells. So you're spending money, it's like you're bleeding out and spending and spending, so keep that in mind, that puts a lot of pressure on the, on the, yeah, if you decide if the solution, if the field was declared commercial, okay, SOC, then we go and enter into the project planning phase. Okay, and we are now, if we go back. Okay, we are um, here, okay? Just the start of the project planning. Then you have to put everything in movement. And the main idea is to, the main purpose of this phase, the main purpose is to identify and screen options to develop this field. Several options to develop the field. Or we can call it alternatives to develop the field. And then after you perform that, the idea is to lock or to to select one of them, to select and define, so we can put it like in steps, select and define a development concept, and the third one is to, to um, Um, yeah, I'm missing something here. Okay, so here it comes, the you know economic evaluation, and the economical evaluation. Okay, 
But then the main objective of all of this process of all of this planning phase is to deliver document the final solution for delivery to the authorities. Okay, it's not enough that you go to the government and you say, well, you know, I'm very knowledgeable, I'm a wise person, so leave it to me, I can do it, you don't worry about anything. Okay, you have to deliver a very big document showing, and you're going to look through this document tomorrow, exactly describing all the characteristics of the field and how you're going to develop. And the government can come and they can tell you very specifically, we don't want that, take it away. Or we think, you know, that shouldn't be done, that's not the way. And they can actually send it back for review, for to use, for to modify it. So the main is not like, you know, you can see, well, serious companies, they say, well, we, we have this process, we have to follow it to, uh, to ensure a very nice product. But maybe there are some companies that they try just to start to get money. They don't care too much to do it in the best efficient way, to do it in the best, most optimum way, to get more information about the reservoir. They just want to start selling oil. Okay? And this is a process where you control that. You avoid, you put a break to that. You say, well, no, you have to do it properly. You have to go and document a series of activities that you have done through that process. Okay, you have, that you have screened and has identified different options and at the end you have selected one of them and you are arguing why are you selecting that option. Hmm? So you all the time have to think about, you know, the good situation, the kind of the good person and the bad person, okay? Or, well. So it's a requirement by the, by the government. Okay, and then inside that phase we had three things that I'm going to mention very briefly, and then we go. I think it's already, for our first day, it's enough. Okay, feasibility studies, concept planning, and pre-engineering. And all of them, we are not going to talk about this decision gate, but we will say, you know, all of them end in the issue of the PDO. Okay, on issuing the, the plan for development and operation. So first, the feasibility studies okay. They first have to say, start to identify very broadly or very, uh, in a very, um, I would say, upper level try to identify ways how to develop the field identify development options in a top level. Then you have to define uh, the objectives of the development. In line with the corporate strategy. Then you have, very important, you have to start creating like very, um, also very rough, but also have an idea of the project timeline. Okay, more or less when are you going to start, you know, executing the project? When are you going to start producing? Remember, time is running. You have spent all of this money. so. You, the investors and everyone in the company is just waiting to see when are you going to get the money back okay so you have pressure it's like you have people watching behind your back uh, waiting when you're going to okay then you have to um something very important you have to identify possible um uh, stoppers or what we call show blockers. Okay. Some, if it's something that is technologically very, for example, very deep water development, 
you don't have certain technology to develop that field because it's very very deep or might be that you are in a very volatile country and then you have a very high risk that there is going to be a coup d'etat okay or there is going to be you know some some change or that you're going to get kicked out because it's going to be pri privatized so you have to identify not only on the technological side but also on, on all the different things and here you have to make a rough cost <coughs> valuation okay of the field you have to give it a number okay how much is this a field of five billion half a billion five hundred you know what what is the field and that's more or less what what is done in this stage then on the other stage concept planning and here the main objective is to already look or already identify already try to define one main concept to streamline one main concept that I'm going to use okay so you say compare um, alternatives for development and uh, and then I have to you know this called the screen out less attractive or non viable options and here you make besides here you made a very rough timeline but here you have to prepare uh, a PEP which is a project for execution okay more detail where you're going to say how the planning is going to be and then the execution so this one describes project and the management <clears throat> and then comes something very important that is defining the commercial aspects the commercial aspects and then also comes into account the legislation taxation okay then comes if I'm developing this field with a partner also comes the agreement with the partners the cons conditions with the partners so here we have market you know for example if I have a f gas finding I have to find who I'm going to sell this gas to okay, if I'm going to develop it with LNG I have to say well is my main market going to be you know uh, Japan or is it going to be the US or is it going to be where I'm going to send this gas if I have to put actually a pipeline I have to see who's going to pay for this pipeline is it the government or is it you know can I do it myself or uh, di different things taxation okay, taxation these are agreements with partners And then here, to our guys that are, you know, very interested in reservoir model, is that where we create our first static and dynamic reservoir model. Okay. And I use that reservoir model to basically predict how much I will be able to produce. Okay, two, that's used for production what is called pro and we are going to talk about that tomorrow production scheduling okay what is going to be the profile of my production with time and this is something extremely extremely important because I told you the only source of income in the field is what I'm selling okay and if that amount that I'm selling I have projected that was hundred thousand barrels and then it was fifty thousand you reduce by half your income 
okay and that has a very important effect on the NPV on the value of the project so that's you know something like a, a very very important part and for those of you that are in reservoir engineering probably you might get the chance to work on that in your professional life so that's called production scheduling or also called the production strategy how many of you have your computers here no okay not many so we do it tomorrow but remember just just tell me tomorrow to remember this uh, you know to show you an example that I have on my website okay something very important we cannot neglect HSE okay we have to define an HSE program then also something very important is the flow assurance issues okay or you create kind of a is like um, a flow assurance management strategy you will see that there are many issues that avoid you know that can block or impede the flow from the reservoir to the facilities there are many things and you have to be aware of these things beforehand you have to already know what to expect and what are you going to do to you know to avoid them uh, and that's you know something because if midway you didn't you know do it properly and it has happened before okay you are producing the field you're happy you're getting revenue and then it stops producing there is a blockage a plug of wax okay some something that we're going to cover later and then that stops producing the field you start you stop getting revenue and then to fix that particular problem it might be very 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 expensive hmm? so this is something that you have to problems related in particular to flow assurance and here we have a bunch of things that we have wax we have something called hydrates that we are going to see later then we have corrosion Okay, then we have something called scale. We have all kind of ugly monster monsters here that we have to. We have slugging. Uh, we have emulsion. Okay, we have erosion. All all kind of things that can cause production to stop. And we have to create a strategy first, detect them, flag them very early, and have a strategy. I'm almost finished, just be a bit patient. Uh, then comes, of course, how are you going to drill the wells and where are you going to put them? Planning the drilling campaign. Okay, not only, so location, okay completion what kind of equipment is it going to have inside how are you going to reach what is going to be the 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 trajectory of these wells then you have to perform a pre-design of the facilities um, okay then so, some other things that are not so important then you perform the pre-engineering that's the last stage and here basically is like you're going to create what do you need you know that one big one company cannot do anything for themselves okay they have to subcontract different parts of the field to different people okay but for these people to know what they have to do they have to get some documents saying I need this and this and this and this okay and that's called um, a technical requirements okay in packages so here you have to say the main objective is to mature and expand the final development option okay that's the main objective of this phase and you have of course to select the final uh, technical solution and then you have to define the technical requirements
for each package okay and each package i mean for the platform you need for the processing facilities you need for the completion you need to define exactly what you need and then someone else has to go inside and design it and actually give you exactly what you need but you have to give some main guidelines about what is that that you need okay and this is called f e e d it's called front also another abbreviation is useful if you remember front end engineering design okay and then of course you have to establish the base for awarding contracts okay, you're going to send what you need to many people and then they are going to get many offers so you have to define a guideline that you're going to use to evaluate this um, then you have to plan and prepare the execution phase and then one more thing that you make is that it's very important you perform an environmental assessment the quality of my handwriting goes down with time so mm -hmm. that's very important you have to say what happens in an unexpected event in a unwanted event you have a blowout or you have a leakage or you have a, a release into the sea how that's going to affect your neighboring environment uh, you have to say also if you for example you're putting a pipe someplace you have a subsea to beach you have the beach and you have a subsea wells and you are flushing it to the sea so you need to make a trench you need to make to receive that pipe on the coast right so you have to say how that is going to affect your your uh, your um, and you will see from this assessment this is very and then comes the last part which is the uh, uh, prepare the pdo they sometimes they call it different names this is plan for development and operations okay in Norwegian is called PUT that stands for Norwegians they already left no we have quite a few plant for put begging or drift okay and also you call it sometimes DP development plan okay but these are like the common common uh, Okay, so with that, I want to finish. You have, you know, 13 minutes before the end time. What, quite okay for uh, the first day. So tomorrow we are going to continue again with the boring part, just to show you again exactly what we have inside. But what can I tell you from this phase, we are going to make one example of um, reserve estimation very early you just have very simple data but you want to use if you have a lot of uncertainty to try to give not only a number but to give a range okay of, of, of numbers based on the uncertainty then we are going to perform this economic valuation and actually we're going to do it like if it were in the concept planning phase calculating NPV just to give it to our manager and that he can take the decision based on the study that we have made uh, then we are going to make also flow assurance later in the course and we are going to um, there was one more thing okay but well tomorrow we are going to look at uh, you are going to look actually at the PDO and we will continue this you know boring part that we have to cover and then we start next week on the technical part so before we finish any question Uh, well, you, it might be interesting for, yes, yeah, I, I will say bring it, please, to class, your, your laptop, if you have. If you don't have, you can always team up with a friend or someone, so uh, I don't think it's a big issue. Okay. No questions? So we close the session. See you tomorrow.